But, and you know, in this story of love between two men, Jonathan is as courage, courageous and virtuous as anybody in the Bible. And yet, he, when he saw God working in David's life, he was willing to love him, even though he would have been next in line to the king. And it really makes no sense. It really makes no sense. And so the love of God is something that we really cannot understand. In fact, we're called in today's passage to know the love of God, which surpasses knowledge. So I could get, have a whole stack of books up here about love, but it's, it's something that ex, it surpasses knowledge. It's something that has to be experienced. So when I saw that the topic was love, I was not too excited about it because it seems so general, so vast. How could we do a sermon? In fact, I was trying to think, okay, what image? I get to pick the image each week. And so what would be an image for the love of God? And I thought of maybe a lot of different things, maybe somebody reaching out to a starving child or different things. But I ended up with the image of the cross. Because there's no way we go back to Easter. We go back to Easter. But today, uh, what I want to do is share with you a prayer. And it is a, a great thing that God gives us access to him in prayer. But I don't think we realize how much he wants to hear from us. And I know this now as a parent. I have great insight into how my parents love me that I didn't get until I was a parent. But now that my daughter lives in Spokane, when she calls on my phone and I see her little name, it's like anybody else, I'm, I'm taking this one. I can't wait to hear from my daughter, right? Well, she called me on April 1st, and I knew whatever she said to me was going to be baloney, because that's how we do. So I, I opened the channel and I listened to her, and she told me some fantastic story about where she works, and I knew it was not true. I was not fished in at all. And I said, well, that's good, honey. I did like to hear your creative writing and creative thoughts. And so then I told her a very outrageous story about our son, Wesley. He's 19. And she goes, oh, Dad, you're just making that up. That's too crazy. I said, no, it's true. No, and I gave her more detail. Oh, Dad, you're just making that up. I go, I'll bet you that it's true. I know it's true. She says, oh, no, it's not. I said, I'll bet you 10 bucks. And she said, oh, okay. And so I text her some photographic proof with a little note that says, you owe your dad 10 bucks, happy April Fool's Day. So I got a little twist, the bank shot. But the point is, God loves to hear our prayers. He loves, like he is waiting for each of us, and it's like a, like a father waiting for his child to talk to him. He loves it, even when it's uh, crazy stuff. And so sometimes our prayers are crazy stuff, sometimes they're little stuff, insignificant stuff, but if we're concerned about it, he's concerned about it. And yet there's also times where we come to him with profound prayers. And our prayer life should grow in maturity, so we can still say the small things, but we should also share with him the profound things. And so I want to look today at a very profound prayer that Paul says for the saints who are in Ephesus. So let's ask the Lord to open up uh, this passage for us and let it just sink deep. Father, we pray that as we see the love that Paul had for these saints at Ephesus, Lord, that we might be moved in our prayers for others to pray more profoundly and also that we might be moved to accept this prayer for us. That if someone were praying this prayer for us, we would welcome it. And it's a challenging prayer, Lord. So it's written 2,000 years ago, but it's fresh. And we just pray that you would make it fresh in our lives today. Give us ears to hear the way that this man, called by you as a missionary, apostle, that uh, his words would resonate deep in our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask this. Amen. So one thing that's amazing about this prayer is that Paul gives it and delivers it while he's in chains. And he's in a Roman prison. And, uh, you know, that can kind of put a damper on the movement, right? You might be anxious, like, oh, maybe this Christianity, they're going to be able to snuff it out because they took our top guy. And look, he's in jail. And he wants to give them great assurances. And that's kind of where we pick it up here. This is Ephesians 3. And we're going to start in verse 11 and move into the prayer. 
And I'm going to read, this is, I'm, I'm going to, I really want the scripture to do the heavy lifting of the sermon today. And it worked out great this morning because I wasn't lifting too well. But the, but the prayer does some heavy lifting. So I'm going to try to read it. I'm really going to work to read it all the way through without commentary. And then we'll go through it one more time with commentary. But just let these words, uh, just think about the context that he's writing to the church that he's just planted in Ephesus or recently planted in Ephesus. And he wants to encourage them while he is in prison. And he's thinking about them. And then he tells them the type of prayer that he is interceding for them. And he says, this was, now this was, he's talking about his imprisonment and torture. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the power through his Spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, that's a lot to mull over. And there's a lot of dependent clauses. And we might try to look at a little parentheticals. It could almost be parentheticals. So we're going to try to walk through it again and see what it is that he is praying for the saints who are in Ephesus and, and also for us too. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. And you get the sense that he's not talking metaphorically here. But in the hard, cold cell, this man is on his knees, interceding for the little churches that he has planted in the Gentile world. And there's a lot of talk, you know, is that the only way to pray? No. Sometimes we read in the scripture people face down praying. Sometimes we see them walking and praying. There's a great story of theologians arguing about this, and a farmer comes up and he says, well, I'll tell you this, the most intense prayer I ever prayed was head down in a well. <laughs> and so he hears our earnest prayers, no matter what our position. But sometimes it's good to bow our heads and, and even be on our knees. Uh, because what? The, the position of our body signifies the position of our hearts that we recognize that we are asking someone with all power. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I think here, Paul's concern is that in some of these churches he was planting, there was a temptation to have the Gentile church and the Jewish believers church. And he wants to say, no, no, no. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free male nor female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. So he's reminding them, look, we are all made in the image of God. Whatever separates us outside the church, when we come into the church, we all come to the same humble place at the foot of the cross. That he would grant to you. So he's asking of God 
who has everything to grant something to the people, to the saints. That's what he calls them, the saints at Ephesus. Ephesus was a wild town. We got to visit Ephesus, and I'll always remember that they had the price and the direction to where the brothel was. It was, it was uh, famous for, their, uh, for Diana, the goddess that could be worshipped in every kind of lascivious way. And he calls them saints. And they've been through a lot of stuff. They, were not, they, they weren't uh, acolytes or in the church choir growing up. These people had a lot of wild life. But now they're saints. They're set apart for God's purpose. That he would grant you. He's gonna, he, they, he wants them to grant them something that they don't maybe have right now. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. This is not out of the riches of his glory. This is according to. This is the standard of. And I heard recently that Bill Gates has $72 billion. And if he were to give a donation of a billion dollars, that could shake a church up. But that would be out of his riches. You see what I'm saying? Versus if he gave the whole lot, that would be according to his riches. Like equal, like David the psalmist, when he's a young guy, he says, bless me according to my righteousness. Like I'm so good and those guys are so bad. Bless me according to my righteousness. But as David gets a little older and a little wiser and a little bit more aware of what sins he's capable of, and we can see being a king, you have great opportunity to sin big. And who's going to call you out except a brave prophet? So then David says in his prayer, according to your loving kindness. It's no longer according to my righteousness. It's according to your loving kindness. In the New Testament, they say it's grace. So according to... To your, according to his glory. Now, what, how great is God's glory? It's way better than 72 billion. It's 72 billion angels plus falling down before him. It's the greatness, uh, it's ineffable. That's the that's trouble with preaching on love. There's no words for it. It's something that we have to experience. And same with God's glory. According to his glory, he says, I want to grant you, according to his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Now, I've got to confess that most of my prayers, even for the church, most of my prayers for the people I love and care about is for the outer man. I pray for sickness, right? I pray for success. I pray for the job. I pray for, you know, all kinds of things that, uh, you know, the things that people want and they, and they put on those cards, they're all mostly, some are intercession. I'm not, I'm not faulting any of these prayers, but I notice that Paul's profound prayer here is not for the outer, it's for the inner man, that they might discover, that they might be transformed from the inside out so that no matter where they are, even in a, Roman prison, they see opportunity in the love of God. That's a profound prayer. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He dwells in our hearts. People have been critical of that theology that we might invite him in. But really, as we look at it, we need to invite him in, not just once when we're saved, we need to invite him in really moment by moment. These are Christians that he's writing to and he's praying that Christ may dwell in their hearts. You know, they're thinking about the glory of God that used to dwell in the Old Testament in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies separated by curtains and walls. And this idea that God would break those walls and tear that curtain 
And now we would be the vessels of the glory of God and Christ would do well in our hearts. And this was promised in the Old Testament that he would have this covenant with us that he would dwell. How can we contain him? How does he seep out? He seeps out with a love that defies words. With a love that really just does not make sense. So we're called to love others. And we're not just called to love others. We're enabled to love others, even if they persecute you or slander you or uh, pin you to a cross. Like Jesus did. Jesus looked down on all those who were crucifying and he said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That was amazing. But how much more amazing when Stephen, the first martyr, just you know, a fallen man like you and me, when he was being pelted to death, he looked up and he saw the glory of Jesus and he said, forgive them. That's mind-blowing. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't come from human love. That comes from something inside of Stephen being transformed into the likeness of Christ. He couldn't do that on his own. And so this is what Paul is praying for, that there will be, just like Stephen, people being transformed. Does this really happen? So about this time, in the first service, I broke into a cold sweat. And it did put the fear of God in these people. No, I did appreciate. They were focused. They were listening. And I called Larry, who was, he doesn't always come. He's moved away. And I said, Larry, come up and give your testimony. See, Larry was known for wild parties in Lucadia. He was rather infamous. He really was. Larry accepted the Lord. I know he had a relationship with the Lord when he was a young man at Calvary, Costa Mesa. And he was on fire for the Lord, he said. But then he just walked away. And the distractions of this world ensnared him. And he went, I bet he went for 40 years just living the party life. And then a friend of his died. And at the funeral, the words of the friend came through a letter saying, just try Jesus. Just try him. And he had walked past this church for 13 years, but those words so motivated him that he came in and said hi. And uh, he said, is there a men's Bible study here? And I said, yeah, we'll get that going. And uh, so he was transformed. He'd always been a Christian, but now he wanted to be rooted and grounded in love. And he was raised by a tough Marine dad. And the idea of a soft heart, he really chafed at it. But he memorized verses, and it was amazing. Uh, so we were doing this discipleship where we would memorize verses and memorize these certain verses. And the more he memorized, the more the Lord was calling him to share them. So he had all these wild friends, and a lot of them were dying just those years of the wild lifestyle that could have taken him. And they all said, well, you're a believer now. And so he was speaking at more funerals than I was. And he had the verses to share because he had memorized them. And it gets even better because he came in saying, you know, I don't, you know, I don't have any relationships and I don't think I'll ever have a relationship. But his heart was growing softer and softer. And guess what? He found a relationship. And it just this last year, uh, he got married to a young lady who had two sons. And a husband that didn't, an ex-husband who didn't care that much for him. And uh, she's a preacher's daughter, by the way. And now he's a stepdad. And he's blessing this woman. And he's really stepped up to be a father. And he's employing people now. It's phenomenal to see all the blessings that he is bringing into people's lives. I think of that preacher who all of a sudden he's got a 
uh, a son-in-law in his congregation with an arm around his daughter. People really do get transformed. And, and it's easy to coast. And it's easy to not pray prayers like this one. And he goes on to say here, I'm praying that you'd be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. Now this rooted and grounded is an interesting turn of phrase too because rooted is kind of organic. It's a botanical word and grounded is more structural like a building, like your foundation. And it's both. I think the roots are what God has to grow through us deeper into the ground. And this is no small thing. You ever tried to take a tree out and get all the roots? It's a epic battle. Anyone can just trim it down to a stump. But if you determine to get the roots out, it's going to be a lot of work. And then the foundation, this is how we have to build. Jesus says, you build by obeying me, you build your life on a strong foundation. Now when the winds come and the storm comes, then you have a life that's not going to crumble. So anybody buy a house? When you buy a house, you don't worry about the paint peeling or the windows broken, right? You worry about the foundation. We were shopping for a house, and there was a beautiful house. Remodeled kitchen. Do you remember? Know? <laughs> but the whole thing just kind of slanted. Like if you drop marbles, they'd all end up on the western wall. Tempting, great price, but the foundation wasn't trustworthy. So he says, you being rooted like you've got roots that God has grown deep into the ground. Remember last week we talked about the seed that fell on the the rocky road, and there was no roots, and so it just withered. You being rooted deep down, grounded in what? In love. Love for God. A preacher uh, tells of a wedding he did. He said it was the most remarkable wedding he ever performed. It was for an older woman that was going to remarry, she felt like all those opportunities were gone. And so she was surprised that somebody would love her. And he did. And she kept saying, I'm old. And he was saying, no, you're beautiful. And she had some baggage. She had a 28-year-old daughter with the mind of a six-year-old six that she's going to raise. You know, that's going to be part of the family for the rest of her life. And so... Uh, they exchanged their vows, and this man really loved her. And then after exchanging the rings, the pastor said, and now the groom has another ring for your little daughter. And so you can just picture this six-year-old in a 28-year-old body. She just screams, and she runs up to the altar, and she throws her arms around the groom. And all she said was, I love you. I love you. I love you. Just clinging to him. And there was not a dry eye in the sanctuary. This is how we ought to love God. And this was a perfect picture of God because he tells us that he loves us like his children. And he gives us another, another metaphor that he loves us like his bride. And so here it was captured so beautifully. We need to have a love of God that says, like we think of that rich young ruler that came up to Jesus. Remember, good teacher? And he said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And he says, what really I think any of us would say to Jesus, you know, I think I've taken care of it. I, you know, I, I did. I, you know, I, I went up when Billy Graham called me up and I, I'm trying to do this, but am I doing it well enough? Am I going to get to heaven? What must I do to get to heaven? That was a very relevant question. He said, how about those commandments? Well, I kept them all. 
And it says that Jesus loved him. He looked at him and he loved him. Like this guy earnestly was keeping the commandments. He didn't realize that the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, and Jesus would add mind. That's a hard one, right? Like who could ever do that perfectly? But that's the first commandment is to love God with everything. And so he said, all right, one more thing you got to do. Sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and you get to be one of my disciples. And that was a great offer. But he couldn't see it because he loved the things of this world so much. And then Jesus said to his disciples, wow, that's hard. Wow, that's tough. It's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And we might think, wow, I'm sure glad I'm not a rich person. Except for, wait a minute, right? Like the poorest person in this room is probably in the top 3% of the what? Is it 7 billion? How many people in the world? We're like the top, maybe we're top 2%. So we're all rich folk. <laughs> Our faces might fall if we say, God, you want everything? Really? How easy could we give it up? I mean, the exchange is great because his disciples say, hey, we've given everything up. Everything we've got was just a few fishing boats and a lot of sweat, and, right? But we've given everything up. Three years we gave up. What did we get? And Jesus said, look, whatever you give up, whether fields or family or friends, whatever you give up in this life, you're going to get back a hundred more hundredfold more in this life or in the life to come. That's a great exchange, right? Like if I said to you, whatever you give me today, I'll give you a hundred times as much next week. Would you be happy? You would be happy if you believed I was good for it. But you probably wouldn't believe I was good for it, so you wouldn't buy it. But if I were Jesus and I gave you that deal, you should be really happy. Like, okay, let me get everything, uh, empty my pockets, man. I'm going to get a hundredfold back if we believe. This is the love that just falls on Jesus and says, I love you, I love you, I love you. I don't care about any of the other stuff. I love you. You're my source. I love you. And Paul is praying that we would be rooted and grounded in love so that the cares and seductions of this world would not attract us, would not distract us from the love of God. This is a powerful prayer. And she comprehended her love for her stepdad. Now, what do we comprehend? His prayer is that being rooted and grounded in love we may be able to comprehend with all the saints. That's great. That's communion. When we come together for communion in just a few minutes, and I'll be careful not to breathe on the elements, but when we come together, we are communing with all the saints. I mean, that's a great, you know, I want to be in that. What is it? I want to be in that number when the saints come marching in. Thank you. I can name that tune in three notes. Very good. Rooting grounded that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. I mean, this is big. Like, we look out in space and we're told our Earth is just a little bitty planet. Here's the big sun in a little bitty universe. And here's the cosmos. And it makes us feel rather small. But this is the God that made all that. There's no way around him. You got to go through him. You got to go through the door. And we're all going to be there. That you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. 
Well, you know, like it's easy as a pastor to pray that the church would be full. But that's not the right prayer. Not that the pews would be full, but that the saints would be full. So it's so easy uh, to come and not be full. It's a choice, just like the roots where we lay the foundation. To be full, we've got to surrender. Just like in, when I had my sweats in the first service, Penny brought me up this glass of water, and it was good. It really helped a lot. But this glass will never be full if there's a big rock in the glass. So I, I could put water in it, but it's never going to be full to capacity if there's a big rock in the bottom of the glass. So he's saying, look, for you to comprehend the love of God, you've got to say, these rocks are not worth it. I want the full water. Why is it that everybody's so thirsty? Why is it that the world's so not satisfied? Why is it that the pleasures of this world just do not satisfy what's really in the inner man? Imagine you were real thirsty, and I said, you know what, i got something for you, an ocean of water. You're thirsty, let's go down, you can drink to your heart's content. You drink forever, you're never going to satisfy your thirst. It's only going to make you thirsty, because it's not the right water. It's not the right stuff. The only thing that can give purpose and meaning and value and power to your inner man is the living water. And so the reason that whatever it is doesn't satisfy us in this world, whether it's wealth or drugs or alcohol or sex or whatever it is, it's not going to satisfy us if we're not tapped in to the living water. And so he's praying that his church, that his saints would be filled up to all the fullness of God. And that's our challenge today as we come to communion. And we ask, we know our sins have been forgiven on the cross 2,000 years ago when he cried out, it is finished. But we still have a nature that will cherish sin in our hearts. Remember that show, The Newlywed Game? It, sounded, it started off kind of edgy and got more and more debauched. But here's the worst question that could ever be asked on that show is what's the one thing that your spouse would not want you to mention today? Isn't that a terrible question? Well, in that sense, I'm going to ask you that question today. What's the one thing you hope the preacher doesn't mention? What's the big rock that you're kind of clinging to? And I'm not going to even try to guess. That's the Holy Spirit's job, to convict us. And and we only are denying ourselves. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think, says the man in the Roman jail, according to the power that works within us. So Paul's saying, look, the power that works in me is the power that works within all of us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I think that includes us. We're in that group. Now I want to look at Jesus' appeal to the church in Laodicea. And he invites them to a communion. And notice this is often used as a passage for new believers. Let him in. Invite him in. But it's really not. It's a passage that is directed to saints, to the church in Laodicea. And he says, Those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. Yikes. Love sometimes is tough. We know that. We spank our kids. It breaks our hearts. They get older. We put them on restriction. We put up all kinds of gates and fences to keep them on the street and narrow. Maybe we don't let them go out on Saturday night, but you know what? We can do all of this, but unless they are changed in the inner man, 
it won't matter. So we have this time until they're out in the world to see the inner man transform. That's the best we can do as parents. And, and when I look at the young people of our church, I do pray, say a prayer like this. Because I see that when they get out, they're going to be so vulnerable. When they get out of high school, you ever see those turtles that lay their eggs on the beach and then the turtles all go to the ocean? You ever see that? All right, I'm glad. Because they, they do it like this. But, but they get out and it's like thousands of turtles. But psh, man, the, the seagulls come down and, and less than 10% actually get in the ocean. That's what our kids are like when they graduate from high school. So if we don't have it deep down inside them that they are rooted and grounded on their own accord, and this is true for anybody you've been praying for, and this is what compels Paul to get on his knees, to say, look, Ephesus, I got persecuted in Ephesus, and I know what's coming for you. And you're not going to have success. You're not going to make it unless you're rooted and grounded in love that transforms people when they see it in you. Jesus said, they're going to know that I came because you love one another with a love that defies words. So he says, those whom I love, that's the good part from Jesus, I reprove and I discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Wait a minute, I thought we repented once when we became Christians. No, we need to repent all the way along the road. What is repent? It means to change our mind and be convinced that what he was saying all along is right. Or maybe it's just something new we hadn't even thought about, but the Holy Spirit's convicted us, and it gets more refined, hopefully, as we walk with him. There's maturity until he comes and takes us home or he comes back. And so of all these things inside of it, if he showed us everything when we first called him into our heart, guess what? I think we just die on the spot. But he's gentle and convicts us gradually as we step by step is a light unto our path, not to see the whole vista, but just walk in the light. So you should be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him. I don't know that that's actually talking about communion, but that sure works for me. I will dine with him and he with me. Because we're going to come to a table where Jesus sat around with his disciples and he said, I can't wait for this night. I could not wait to be here with you guys. And that's the night he was betrayed. And he just wanted to be with them. And he explained to them that he would have to die. And it would be great for them because they would receive indwelling with the Holy Spirit. So now we move to communion. And we could easily, you know, just say, okay, Lord, I showed up. That was pretty good. And now, I, you know, I'm going to take the cup and the the bread, and that'll be good, and that ought to be enough. But that's not the heart that clings to Jesus and says, I love you. I love you. I love you. So the prayer is, is that the church would be full when it walks out of the doors today. That's a prayer. And uh, his spirit can do that if we're willing, if we surrender. So he's going to come in and we're going to be tempted to leave some doors closed and some rocks in the cup. And so the challenge today, that's the question you don't want to hear. The thing you don't want the pastor to say, that's where the Holy Spirit's working in your heart. Open that door up. Trust him in that nook and cranny. And then we can be full, not much more. And the goal is that we would be full, filled up to all the fullness of God for his glory. Let's pray. Father, what a remarkable prayer. Do we appreciate Paul praying this for us? Wait a minute. Do we really want this? Wouldn't we rather just walk softly with the Lord? No, you want in. And you want to fill us with your fullness. And as we contemplate this prayer and the love that Paul had for these saints in Ephesus, Lord, we do want you to call to mind 
the people we love. Lord, maybe we've been engineering uh, ways that they might come to church or finagling ways that we might uh, get them to open up a Bible or read a tract. But Father, we know the deep work, the work that only your Holy Spirit can do, the love of God that will fill them and transform them and make them lovers of the world, not that uh, we love you, but that you first loved us. That's the only way we can love. And it's not a flow chart, Lord. Sometimes it means being strict, and sometimes it means loving mercy, and we just can't do it on our own wisdom. We can't do it in our own strength, but we can do it if we're filled with the fullness of God's love. And so, Lord, as we come to this table, we don't want to cheat you, but we really would only be cheating ourselves. And we want to give your Holy Spirit freedom to reign within us, and we don't want to hold any doors closed. We want to open up to you. And we invite your Holy Spirit to take inventory on our soul. The things that have been so tempting, so enduring, Lord, we give them up. Because we just want to cling to you. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We love you. And the rest of the world just fades in comparison. Do this work in our hearts today. For your glory. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.